I look back, when I was in elementary school, I was probably what you would consider one of those uh, goody goody two shoes. One of those really good, like, studious students. Real young elementary. Real. real. It's really hard now to have parents <laughs> Okay, let me rephrase that. I thought I was a really good, studious child. I guess I wasn't. But it stands to reason that I loved biographies. And like my first couple of years, I was like this little biography nerd. I'd just get into them and I'd read them. And then what I would do is I would then write a research report. Like, Pinnacle of excitement. That's what I went through as a little kid. I wrote probably hundreds of these reports. And I like learning these new informations about these historical figures and these presidents, particularly. One of my favorite historical figures was Abraham Lincoln. For a while, I was like a real junkie on Abraham Lincoln. Like, I knew a lot of facts. I could even quote you the entire Gettysburg Address. Don't ask me to do it today. I don't know that. But that being said, I knew facts about Abraham Lincoln. I knew things on him. Now, people today, there are a lot more people that probably know way more facts on Abraham Lincoln than I will ever know. But here's the thing. Even the person who is the most well-versed in Abraham Lincoln trivia and who he was, they never actually met Abraham Lincoln. There's nobody today that's alive that would have ever met him. In order to have met Abraham Lincoln, you would have to be 154 years old because he was killed on April 15, 1865. Here's the thing about every world religion. They have the same problem. You can know all of the information about your religion, about your God, but with religions, you never actually know your God personally. You don't have that relationship. It's about doing. Religion, it's all about man's way to God. Us trying to get right with God. In some way, us doing deeds to get right before God. This is what actually separates Christianity from all other world religions. Because Christianity, it's about God coming to man. Where we couldn't do it, where we couldn't fix our sin problem, God saw that. He saw our need and he came to us. That's what we celebrate at Christmas time. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. We've talked about it. The Word became flesh. And dwelt among us. This is what separates us when it comes to Christmas. That the Savior, the creator of the world, he stepped into his creation to rescue us from the problem that we created. Now, we're going to look briefly this night at this Christianity and the personal relationship with a personal God. Because Today, if you've been joining us for anything, this is a kind of set-apart series. We've been looking at who is God. And tonight we're going to look at a God who is personal. We serve a personal God. But before we dive into it, let's pray. Lord, <laughs> it's funny. We can pray to you. Lord, we know that you hear us because you are a personal God. Lord, you're invested in us. You care about us. Lord, you want a relationship with us. Lord, our prayers don't just hit the ceiling. It's not just a vain uh, thing to do, Lord, but it's to communicate our hearts to a Savior who loves us so dearly. Lord, who came to this earth to rescue us, to save us from our sin. Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, I thank you that... A couple thousand years ago, you stepped into the world you created, Lord, as a little itty baby, for the purpose of dying on a cross, Lord, for my sins, Lord, to rescue me from that pending doom that I was facing. Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, I thank you that you are personal, and we can come before you this evening. And I pray that you speak to our hearts and challenge us. Amen. The God of the Bible... 
The God that you read about in Genesis, all the way through the God that you read about in Revelation. The God of the Bible is a personal, intimate, and invested God. From the very beginning, God, he communicated to his creation. When you look at a passage in Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, it says this, They, and it's speaking of Adam and Eve, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden, in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now, I tried as I was preparing this, I have tried to wrap my head around what that must have looked like, how that must have felt, but somehow, some way, there is a personal God who is in the garden with Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve, after they sinned, after they broke because of their rebellion, this relationship with God, they went and hid. And God, he appears on the scene, and as he's walking in the garden, they hear the sound of God. I don't even know what that means. I, don't even, I can't even fathom that. But they hear him, and they hide themselves from the presence of the Lord. As you can, in fact, as you look through this, we have an intimate relationship, an intimate connection with God. The fact that God, all throughout the Old Testament, you see how prevalent he is in communicating to people. He, he spoke to Moses by a burning bush. You can see that in Exodus chapter 3. He spoke to Elijah in a still, small voice in 1 Kings 19. And he spoke to Isaiah in one of my favorite passages in this heavenly vision in Isaiah chapter 6. But God, all throughout history, has communicated. He has spoken to people. And the list goes on and on and on. But if you've got your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to Hebrews chapter 1. That's going to be where we are. And Hebrews chapter 1, this, the author of Hebrews, he is going to be looking at this God that is a personal, intimate God. He's going to be looking at this Christ the Son of God, who he sent to this earth. And in Hebrews 1, 1 through 4, that's all we're going to read tonight, but it says this, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets, in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And, is, and he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made perfection, a purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a much more excellent name than that. God, again, as you read the Old Testament, God spoke uh, using the prophets long ago to people. And today, as you pick up the Bibles, you can still hear God's words. You can still read what God spoke through these prophets. One thing I love about Christmas is that God, he isn't just this distant God who left us orders and commands from afar. That's not what Christmas is. This is not a long, distant type relationship that we have with God. No, God is not just this big, booming voice that maybe you hear occasionally. That's not how it works. God, he stepped into his creation. He came in the form of a baby. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Praise the Lord that he didn't just create and then step away. He could have done that. He could have said, I created all of this. You guys messed it up. You guys rebelled against me. I'm done. And wipe his hands clean. That's not the God that we serve. We serve a personal God who, who after he created, and he created us as special, as intimate beings. What he did is he saw that we rebelled. He saw that we made a big mess of things that we couldn't fix. He 
And he chose to love us so much that he'd come and take on the form of a baby to rescue us. It's pretty incredible. God, he, he, it's so incredible. Uh, the arrival of Jesus, that's what we celebrate on Christmas. Tomorrow when we wake up, it is all about Jesus Christ coming to this earth. Presents are nice, but really it all points us to that ultimate gift of Jesus. Now I want you to look at this passage in, 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 in Hebrews chapter 1, how it describes Jesus, which is God's Son. In verses 2 through 4, it says, In these last days has spoken to us his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he uh, had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels, as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. God, he appointed Jesus heir of all things. Now the word heir, it's a very interesting word. It means one who receives his allotted possession by right of sonship. God has appointed Jesus over everything. And through Jesus, God made the entire world. Everything that we see, it talks about this throughout the Bible. It talks about how God used Jesus to create the world. It talks about in this passage how Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. The word radiance, that is another very interesting word. It means reflected brightness. That's what it means. So yesterday, when we were all together, we kind of talked about how the moon reflects the sun. And how we are kind of to be that moon, and we're to kind of reflect the sun to those that we come in contact with. And in the same way, this radiance, if you want to kind of keep that illustration in your head, Jesus Christ is that perfect reflection of God. If you have a desire to know who God is, I challenge you. Look at Jesus Christ. Become more Christ-like. You will know who God is because Jesus, he is God. God in the flesh. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Pretty incredible. Uh, if you want, uh, as you kind of look through this, once Jesus, he made the once-for-all substitutionary sacrifice on our behalf, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. You think about that. And at the cross, when it was all said and done, he said, it is finished. There was nothing else that needed to be tacked on. There was nothing else that needed to be done. We cannot bring anything to the table that improves what Christ did on the cross. Yeah. Jesus, God in the flesh, did what no one else could have done. You think about that candy cane again. I told you I'd reference it. But you remember what this candy cane looks like. It's white. It's got this kind of, actually, the tradition says that it was originally just a white sugar stick. Before you add the pepper, it was just this kind of candy that was white. Well, it's all about God being holy. His holiness, it, it, he is set apart. I don't think we really can even fathom that. It's not just... God is without sin. Because, believe it or not, God was holy before sin ever existed. God is set apart. It's unbelievable. We serve a holy God. We see that with that light. The red, the shed blood of Jesus on our behalf. Do you realize he didn't have to do that? He chose to do that, to sacrifice himself. To shed his blood to go through that agonizing death because he loves you. Because he loves me. I said it before here and I, I stand firmly behind it. If I was the only person on earth, I believe wholeheartedly that Jesus Christ would have died for me on that cross. And I believe if you were the only person on earth, that Jesus Christ would have died for you as well. Because he is a personal, intimate, and invested God. He cares about. The red stripes, 
You think about that, and, and some are kind of big and thick, and some are kind of small. Think about what Jesus went through. Think about that crucifixion and all the, the difficulties and the whippings and all that that led up to it. That's what Jesus did on our behalf. Hebrews 4.15, it says this, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. I think the word that Jesus is our high priest, that we don't have to go through anybody else. When we pray, we can pray in the name of Jesus Christ, and we know that God the Father will hear us. We know that He will, he will hear everything we say. He knows our weaknesses. He knows those areas that we are tempted, those areas that we struggle that we continue to struggle. He knows everything about those. In every way, he was tempted like us, yet without sin. That's the incredible thing. There is victory in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Where we couldn't do it, where we would be tempted and we will continue to fall on our own strength. Jesus, the gospel, the word became flesh and blood. It changes everything. We've been talking about this, that the, that the gospel, it's not just about eternity. It's not just about my fire insurance, that someday I got my check cashed, my ticket punched. I'm going to be spending one spot, the dwelling place, with God in heaven. It's not about just that. The gospel is about today. It's about Jesus Christ and the things that you are going through in all ways. He understands those things. He wants you to call on. He wants to be involved in whatever you are going through. You don't have to face anything alone. Jesus, he chose to come to us. I want you to think about that. He was under no obligation to come. He didn't have to. He came to us because he is personally invested and that he loves us. God, he created everything for his glory. And then what he did is he set man and the pinnacle of his creation over everything, to kind of be the, the steward, the overseer, the caretaker of what he did. God, he wants us to enjoy what he created. However, in order to fully <coughs> do that, to fully enjoy his creation, God has given us some boundaries. You see that in his word. God places some safeguards for us to fully and truly enjoy the creation that he has given us. So that we don't needlessly hurt ourselves. So that we don't get ourselves into trouble. He tries to protect us. Again, all of this, everything about who Jesus is and all that God has done in creation, it points us to the fact that there is evidence of a personal, intimate, and invested God. So what? This Christmas season, I want to challenge us to realize that we don't serve a faraway God. We don't serve a disconnected God. We serve a personal, intimate, and invested God. We celebrate this season, this Christmas season, the arrival of a very loving God who would come on our behalf <coughs> to the world that he created to rescue us in our hopeless state. Emmanuel. We talk about that. That name, it means God with us. Emmanuel. Again, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. And the Word was with God. He flashed forward. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Praise the Lord for this. Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ, as you see him in Genesis, that skull crusher, that, uh, that pointing one that we were all looking for, the rescuer. He came, and he comes, he came, and we celebrate his coming tomorrow. So as we wrap up today, I just want to challenge you. He knows you personally. The Bible talks about how he knows every hair on your head. He knows you intimately. When we turn that around, do you know God? Do you truly know the God of the Bible? Do you know Jesus Christ? 
<coughs> That's life changing. Do you know Jesus? If you don't know Jesus, or you're struggling and you're like, I don't see how this whole thing even connects. Please, I want to challenge you. Please don't leave tonight without seeing me. Talk to me. There's nothing I'd rather do than talk to you about Jesus. Because that's the whole reason why we got together tonight. It's cool. I love the candle thing. And in a minute we're going to do it. And it's going to be really fun. And it's going to be really peaceful. And we're all going to kind of reflect on stuff. <coughs> Don't forget the real reason of the season. Jesus. Emmanuel. God will. Dear Lord. I thank you for your son. Lord, I thank you that he came to seek and to save that which is lost. Lord, that is me. <laughs> you can put my name right there, Lord. Uh, without this, I'm hopeless. Lord, I, I'm destitute. Lord, this changes everything. Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, I thank you that we can celebrate this each and every year until you're coming back. Lord, there's coming a day. Oh, Lord, it's not going to be a, a forever distant and, and just praying to. Lord, there's going to be a chance that we can actually rub elbows with you. And I'm excited for that because, again, you've made it a reality, Lord. You talked about how hope, Lord, it is a confidence. It is a done deal. Lord, we thank you for that. And that's why we celebrate. Because we can trust you. Because you're holy. You're good. You're loving. Thank you for all. In your precious name.